So uh, I guess I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is frame this evening's talk. Um, it's really, I really, when I started here and I heard that Shirley was going to be in town, I thought I'd take this opportunity to kind of invite the fans and people who appreciated Shirley's work and also those who may not have known her work before to come and kind of have a bit of a holistic introduction to Shirley's uh, very prolific and interesting practice. And so what I'm going to do is we're going to have a conversation and we're going to go throughout the conversation looking at different pieces of work. Um, there'll be, we're going to do that for about, I guess, 40 minutes and then there'll be room for questions. So please do um, propose your questions, provocations, etc. But of course, if you're burning or dying, please uh, do, do pop in and uh, interject. We like two-way conversations here. But I'll start off, I think, with giving uh, a bit of an introduction about Shuli Chang, the artist. Um, and I'm going to read it because it's quite a, a <coughs> hefty and impressive career that you have. Shuli. So Shuli Chang, I believe, is one of the legendary artists of our time. Working with multiple media, she has been working in the field of net-based installation, engaging with interactive social interfaces and film production for over three decades. Her net installation works are in the permanent collections of the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, the ICC in Tokyo, and the Guggenheim Museum, for which her work Brandon was the museum's first online commission. Brandon was conceived as a collaborative piece that would unfold over the course of a year. Looking at the complexity of gender, sexuality, and identity through the life and death of Brandon Tina, Tina Brandon, a Nebraska youth who was raped and murdered after her biological sex as a woman came to light in 1993. This was, of course, before work was produced before Hilary Swank's Oscar turn, I might add, in Boys Don't Cry. The work is oft cited in new media art history as one of the first widely recognized pieces of net art. Shuli has made two theatrical feature films, Fresh Kill, which premiered at the Berlin Film Festival in 1994 and was included in the Whitney Biennial in 1995 and IKU, produced by Tokyo Uplink, which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in 2000, eliciting quite a bit of surprise at its premiere. Maybe we'll talk about that at some point. Uh, the film is a Japanese sci-fi porn feature. <coughs> In Japanese, IKU means when arriving at orgasm. The film, it can be argued, is a sequel to Blade Runner. It is a story of IKU Koder Reiko, who is a replicant belonging to the Genome Corporation, which sells virtual sex. Reiko collects orgasm data through sex with human beings. Shuli Chang has previously exhibited in two Whitney Biennials, the Johannesburg Biennial, at the Reina Sophia in Madrid, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, the New Museum of Contemporary Art in New York, my former um, place where I used to work, Fact in Liverpool in 2008, Public Net Base in Vienna, the Brooklyn Museum, and the Venice Biennale. She has produced projects for Creative Time in New York, La Borelle in Spain, and the pa Palais de Tokyo in Paris. And her work is in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. She has co-founded several collectives, including Kingdom of Piracy, based in NetSpace since 2001, Mumbai Streaming Attack, based in Zurich since 2003, and Take 2030, based in London since 2003. In 2007, she launched Moby Opera, a collective public cinema made of mobile phones at the New Frontier section of the Sundance Film Festival. Shuli's career began in New York with collectives such as Paper Tiger Television and Deep Dish TV. Shuli was once quoted as saying that the medium I choose for each project that I am engaged in is in itself a feminist statement. So I think with that, maybe we could end the bio <coughs> section and begin our conversation. Thank you so much, Shuli. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I guess there's a mixture of people here, some of which, some of whom will know your practice intimately and some of whom won't know it at all. Um, and I thought that it would be worth starting, I guess, at the beginning, if that's possible. Um, <laughs> like the decommer is a surprise that if you want to start from the beginning. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think um, you started off working in, with uh, Paper Tiger Television, which um, broadcast on public access TV in the United States. Um, and I guess maybe it's worth telling us a bit about your interest in, in working in that context and how you came um, to be interested in public access TV when you started working at that time. Hmm. I think, yeah, in, in reflection, it, all, it actually all kind of come together, you know, why uh, my participation in Paper Tiger TV or Dish TV actually affect quite dearly the whole path of my work. Um, 
At that time, I graduated, you know, it's like early 80s in New York City. I graduated from the cinema studies at New York University. And uh, it was very difficult to make films at the time. And um, actually, my, my great partner oh, at the time was Ani. <laughs> we are like really best friends, and uh, we actually share space together also. So, but uh, at the time, it was quite difficult to make films. So, um, you know, then, then we kind of, I kind of got involved with uh, Paper Tiger because it was a kind of weekly public access TV program, so you sort of, you know, do a light television. Uh, of course, with the light television, you have a lot of broadcast possibility and also a lot of, you know, whatever, the super effects mixing is all kind of down on the spot. And, um, but the theme was also right to my alley in a way, it was about media criticism, uh, particularly on the mainstream media, how the media covers uh, different news and stories like that. So um, at that time, of course, I, I was coming from a very like, uh, you know, the racist, uh, racist media, the kind of, uh, you know, of course, the sex gender issue also. So yeah, it, it does um, affect me or it does guide me through a, a very difficult period of trying to find my direction. You know. Well, to think about it today is like, you know, today we are on the web, everybody has the channels, the blog, the video. And so it's, it's interesting to think about at that time how hard it was to struggle to sort of have your voice heard, that kind of thing. Yeah. But public access is something that I, I guess is, is I mean, I, I got confused with public service TV when we were talking yes. earlier. Yeah, yeah. That it was, in a sense, an, a space where you could broadcast independently. Um, and I'm curious how many, how was it, was it seen as an act of intervention or an act of, was it a, was it a struggle for representation at that time while you started to Exactly, it was, it was totally about representation. Uh, as far as the channel, it was actually quite, uh, it was actually quite limited in a way because it's definitely not a national broadcast, it's really city based. So almost like at that time, uh, in America, like different cities would have their own public access station. And it's part of the kind of federal law, uh, broadcast law, to say, okay, if we have a television station, we should be given the community some sort of access to, to broadcast. You know? So that's why it came about. But it's a very, uh, it will, I would say it's a kind of very DIY practice. You would have a a small studio like where we are here, and you have a TV cam, you have a two TV camera intercutting, and uh, you know, and people are learning how to do this kind of television format kind of thing. Yeah, so that was uh, how we got started. Too. And I mean, how did, what made you want to break away from that and start to create your own work? Then? I think in a certain way, at the time, my my first piece of work. <laughs> It's really kind of funny that uh, my first piece of artwork is called Color Schemes, which I use, uh, well, I actually use a washing machine. Um, I use some washing machine to do the installation. And it's a, kind of all taking about the metaphor of color wash or white wash in that sense. And uh, um, at the time, I think, you know, I think it was a, my first installation. I had no idea of what should be or whatever, but it was a quite complicated installation because it does have a sort of a sense of control. It has like a coin operated washing machine. It has like synchronization of three washing machine. Um, I was just bored. You know, I think in a way that uh, I need to get things uh, beyond a, a more straight documentary or straight talking head kind of thing and uh, so when I can see this piece and was amazing thing happened was that it went directly to the Queenie Museum as a one person show. Mm. So that kind of started my whole art work. Yeah. Which is quite unusual. I think people would go through the kind of gallery out, you know, loose and before you get to the museum but uh, then Sadly, that I never got the gallery 
stay going. You know, I did have a few galleries, but then you had to just been walked through. Yeah. Is I mean, you how did the, I mean you were working in New York at a time, and I've had a quite a few conversations with different artists about working in New York in the early and mid '80s and about how it was arguably the center of of the global art world, but also a space where artists were critiquing in their works issues around race, gender representation. I remember the artist Judith Barry once telling me that when she was invited to the Whitney Biennial in 87, she was inspired to create work um, that sought to critique the notion of Americanness in the museum. Um, and I'm curious how that actual environment of New York at the time influenced the work that you were producing and the output that came afterwards. Well, absolutely, I, I still think like New York in the 80s is fantastic for artists and also actually, it was actually uh, also a very bad political era with Reagan, you know, so like the whole politics uh, being so conservative and so we were all out on the street, you know, I think for me that's where the whole media activism really came about for me. You know, I was really on the street filming and then project, you know, sort of projecting. There was act up, you know, there was Paper Tiger TV doing kind of global connection with D-Dish TV, you know, and then kind of expanded, I think, in terms of different issues, like you have labor issue, you have racism issue, you have a, a woman worker issue, whatever. Some of these issues really come around, you know, and then, you know, with the, the kind of act up AIDS crisis, you know, all that kind of, we are really like a, a street community, you know. Uh, uh, in a way, there was, a, there was really issues to fight for. There was really, you know, things that we tried to make changes, you know, so it was a quite amazing time, yeah. I was hoping we could start to look at maybe some work, some clips oh. of work. Um, from those beginning periods, so maybe maybe if we could just glimpse. Um, I know you told me that you don't carry around much work pre two thousand with you, but if there's any yes. any any reference to those fluttering objects of desire, right. fresh killer color schemes that we okay. can see. Mm. Actually. This is um just uh, let me see if I should um, also move to the whole uh, Are you trying to do a slideshow or? Yeah. <coughs> Go to the slideshow. Hopefully it could uh, work with this, uh, but I can't really do unprevented. I've got a way to do it. Yeah, this, this folder is called like the work on the right. Mm -hmm. Well, if you just um, yeah. select it all, mm -hmm. and then you do that, mm -hmm. okay. okay. It's not so much in order, but Oma, really, <laughs> I think Oma just sent me an email like yesterday and said, would you like to talk about like kind of pre-2000 kind of work? And I was like, oh dear, that's really tough, you know. <laughs> but it's good to uh, realize that. So what you're seeing here was that I, I put a uh, performance into washing machine and it's really all talking about kind of race and gender issue. And this particular piece of work is called Those Fluttering Objects of Desire. And it's more about uh, gender issues, gender politics kind of thing. And uh, you will see the, the two view. This is me when I have black hair. Uh, <laughs> um, this piece is actually come from the movie 1994, Fresh Kill. I don't really have that many pictures with me but you kind of can um, get an idea. So Fresh Q was made in 1994. Again, it was kind of pre end the whole eco cyber -noia. That's what I call it, eco cyber movie. So that was 1994. <laughs> and then? If you, yeah, I think, yeah, it's kind of, um, oh, sorry, I always kind of keep. This is a piece I really like very much, but what you can see is like two views. This is actually the view when I first exhibited in the gallery called Exit Art, and then it got into the Whitty Biennial. 
and so this was like kind of change position in the Whitney Biennial. Um, basically, it's, um, I collaborated with many, many performers in this piece, maybe about 20, and people were making different video clips, but all the video clips was made with, um, well, at that time it was like, what do you call it? It's a paper, it was just like, it was not, not really making video, and the phone, it's also coin operated, so you actually have to, you know, it's kind of porno booth idea. You actually put in the coin to be able to listen to the phone, and uh, you also can uh, sort of switch on the, the video part in terms of uh, you know, uh, viewing the clip. You actually have to pay 25 cents. That was mostly with the museum at the time. The argument was like, who owns those coins? You know? mm -hmm. Where does the coin go to? You know? Actually, Mike Stubb said to me that he wanted to do something similar in a show, but use bitcoins to let people actually access the exhibition. So it's interesting to see it used. In his Remind story. him that I did it already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but and you said that you worked with lots of different performers, and I'm interested about how you saw these works as a collaboration and how you mobilized particular groups of people to create these works at the time. Um, what what were your particular strategies that you were interested in? in terms mm. of who you, who you chose to approach in terms of the performers as well? Mm, this particular piece with uh, color scheme was, would be my first installation piece, um, but it gathered together uh, 12 performers, all the um, non-white performers. Um, they kind of all talk about um, a bit of different story about their encounter in the mainstream world, or casting, that kind of thing. Um, I was pretty much part of that performance downtown New York performance scene, you know, knowing a lot of performers. So when the proposal came, I said, I really want to make a, a piece about this, and people do come, you know, mm. including Jimmy Durham, mm. who became mm. very famous. Uh, so it was uh, fantastic, but uh, I think Matthew Fuller here would probably argue that uh, how I got people involved is like I cook. <laughs> that actually still works, you know. Uh, I think when we did color schemes, I think the whole project is probably conceived in the kitchen. You know, it's like you just come and eat together and you kind of uh, work out the whole scenario. So. so then how did you move from this work to perhaps some of what you're most known for now into, into cyberspace and net space then? I think by the time I, I finished Fresh Q, I basically decided that I would uh, migrate myself, or I call it homestead, um, migrate myself to uh, cyberspace. This was 1994. And it was really the starting of a lot of, you know, things happening in the internet. I, I think, yeah, I think at that time it was very difficult to get on. You know, of course, uh, with Fresh Q, I was uh, doing a lot of research with BBS. You know, so like I was kind of part of these kind of a lot of BBS, a lot of inside hacking scene. You know, I was in touch with 2006 uh, a Hacker Magazine, and so there was a the whole hacker scene happening at the time that I was in touch with. Um, then comes the World Wide Web, became more accessible, you know, I think um, the first World Wide Web interface, Mosaic, right? At that time, I, I remember I actually had to go to, uh, I actually had to went to go to uh, Columbia University to look at a uh, World Wide Web installation with Mosaic browser by Montadas. You know, and that was such a journey to, to go into the university library to say, I really want to know what this is about, the World Wide Web, you know. So I did that, and then in 1994, I also uh, I got a residency in Tokyo. So I went to Tokyo, and I think at that time, I, I checked into Tokyo University, and that was a time um, all this development is happening and because I sort of situated myself in a university lab that I was able to, you know, access to a lot of new technology. Mm -hmm. A bit of robots too, right, <laughs> in Tokyo, yeah, so. 
So how, how, let's come to Brandon then specifically. Yeah. I know the piece is currently off mm -hmm. but it, can we show the... Yeah, I will show some photo. It's, um, uh, the piece being offline is a very sad story actually, but uh, I don't probably won't get into that. Oh, am I supposed to be in the project? No. Uh, no, I think it's still here. Yeah. I think it would yeah. be. Do you have a USB pen inside? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. That will be this, not this one. Yeah. And then where are you going? The binder. Uh -huh. okay, I have the binder. Do you want to see that? Yeah, okay, sure. Mm -hmm. So, can you talk us through how you, I suppose, how you conceived. Oh. No, mm. um. Well, Brandon came about sort of at the junction of dealing with virtual space and physical space. You know, um, yeah, so it was really at the junction of physical space and virtual space. I. I think particularly probably uh, when we talk about the case with the, the case with uh, Brandon Tina, but at the same time there was actually a case that probably um, probably affect me even more would be a, a Ray in the Cyberspace by Julian Dibble at the time that was published probably also around 1993. Mm -hmm. um, so there was this article a Ray in the Cyberspace and the the whole Brandon Tina story came out. Um, the question at the time, I think, you know, this is another thing I think in the beginning or early net period, I think people were really focused on the identity thing, your avatar identity uh, kind of question. So I think the piece of uh, Brandon really came out from that particular 90s uh, beginning on the net and, and the, the whole people, how people migrated to cyberspace, assuming different identity and play around with different identity, get into trouble by, by you know, assuming different avatars, that kind of thing. Um, so I think the big question Brandon was asking is more like how you gonna surf through the actual and virtual space in this way, yeah. Um, the piece was originally, um, I guess it was the beginning, I just finished the long feature film and to get into the cyberspace for this piece, and um, I was really thinking also about the narrative, and I think the narrative is actually probably a, a very important part of a lot of my work, a kind of scenario narrative coming from a filmmaker background. So even for Brendan, I think the first thing I say was that I want to do a, a piece that would last one year, and the narrative would develop along the period of one, one year on the on, on the net. So, so, so how did it de how did it develop collaboratively, and how was it meant to be experienced on when at the time? That was a, the, the the piece was designed with different interface, and so you can enter by going into different interface. Like this one is actually called Road Trip. And it's a it's an interface that you can keep acting different episodes, and and I have created a lot of different episodes, of different kind of persona, you know, including Brandon, including different persona who change gender from male to female, female to male. Um, there's a piece called uh, uh, interface called Moonplay. This one. Um, yeah. And so this one actually is it's really creating a chat. Uh, um, it was actually a, a chat applet, but uh, with uh, <coughs> it was not. Really a, um, it had you know you're basically chatting with uh, with bots. You know, I kind of feed the lines with the bots. So you, whenever you get online, you're chatting with someone, but they are really bots. You know, so then there's also. <coughs> I actually kind of not commissioned, but I asked a few writers to work with me, including um, including my favorite science, science, science fiction writer, Pat Cadigan, and they all kind of contribute different tests. And then so when you get on the chat line, the bot actually takes 
any text from the from all these different writers and just kind of feed to you, you know. Um, in a way, it, it is a critique about the whole chat room sort of uh, phenomenon at the time, you know. I, I still think it's very 1990s. Um, this particular interface is called Panarticum, and uh, it came from my whole research on Panarticum, and it actually constructed as a 12 cells that, uh, that we have all these kind of so-called um, abnormal gender changer kind of people, everyone can occupy a room. And uh, there's also hospital. Um, at that time, for this particular piece, I, I make a crazy, very, very crazy proposal, which uh, at the end didn't come through, didn't get realized. But I'd I like to talk about this proposal with the Guggenheim Museum. What happened was I, I proposed to have a male to female a male to female surgery happened in Tijuana, Mexico, and a female to male surgery happened in Amsterdam. And I have gone to both cities <laughs> to check in with the doctors and I have um, I have two uh, really uh, two transgender people who want to make this surgery and we will do this as a performance with a streaming parallel kind of idea and the museum actually approved to, to, to the streaming possibility from the two surgery space, one in the hospital in Amsterdam and one in, uh, in Tijuana. Uh, but what happened was in Tijuana, I went to, we went to see this doctor, but then it turned out to be a scam, you know. Like, if you understand, at the time of the 90s or 80s or even back in the 70s, uh, in America, there are a lot of transgender people when go to who go to uh, Tijuana, Mexico, across the border to have their <coughs> transsexual uh, surgery because of the price, because of the budget, the economy reason. Um, so we really want to make that as a political statement. But uh, anyway, the, that particular stream didn't work out. So the panaticum come from that particular parallel in terms of the kind of mental disorder or what considered to be mental disorder and the kind of real uh, surgery, uh, sort of physical transformation of the gender, you know, so that was that, yeah. I mean, you raise an interesting point when you say that you were considering streaming those, those two things into the museum, and I, I guess that's, kind of before, right before the, the whole big color phenomenon and the whole, um, I guess, vogue of reality TV had really come, really taken, uh, really come to the fore of, of societal debates. So I'm just curious how, if you could give us a bit more detail about how the museum responded to that. I mean, did, did, did they see it as part of the artwork and hence there was no question asked, or was it a process of convincing? Because it seems that at this particular time in the United States, that there was a much more liberal approach towards thinking about including these narratives in the museum, which perhaps that attitude isn't there at this particular moment in time. Yeah. Actually, I think throughout my, my art work, career, um, mm, and actually, before I concede this project, uh, I did another project, Walker Art Center, that called Bowling Alley. And for that piece, um, I encountered a lot of trouble with the museum. Uh, it's exactly a kind of censorship issues, all the the kind of editing. Uh, the museum want me to edit a lot of a lot of stuff that's supposed to be streaming in. You know, mostly at the time was test, and so. In a certain way, when I conceived this project, Brandon, for the museum, I thought it's perfect. I say, like, I'm going to do this one year, and it's going to be a work in progress for the whole year of work and development. You cannot preview any other work that's shown in the museum. And I, I remember I'm going to the museum to see my curator, and I'll just show him, like, all these different interfaces, and I was just, like, not showing the naked body part, the bloody part, you know. And at, at the time, it was uh, also the Guggenheim Museum was like into like they're gonna really build this whole like virt virtual museum. There was a lot of hope, a lot of anticipation 
to the virtual museum idea, but then nobody's worried about content in a way. You know, everybody's working on, is worried about the format, the 3D, how the museum can be navigated on the web, rather than worry about like, oh, there's a few bloods or peanuts or whatever floating on your website, you know? Um, so I thought that was a really good thing. <coughs> and in a way, I, I thought about it always like, why the reason I say, well, okay, I'm gonna do this in one year and you just have to check it out on the website as it's developed. Um, so, um, but it was great. I have a great curator, John Han Hart, who actually really amazing. He's also the same character, uh, curator that took me to the Queen in the beginning. Um, we did do a few different uh, streaming between, uh, at that time actually I was working at Vast Society in Amsterdam, which is also a media lab, so um, we did do a few audio streaming at the time with different kind of forum, uh, as you can see here, that kind of have an interface of, of streaming mostly audio at the time. Um, then what happened was that uh, the reason I, I went to Amsterdam uh, with the Media Lab of uh, our society was they have this uh, really 17th century theatre anatomicon and so it is here that I also did a few installations uh, and then this was at the time at the museum in New, New York they only have a website display but they sort of you know have a kiosk for people to sort of interact with. Yeah. I want to jump now to, you touched on this idea of science fiction when you were mentioning Pat's contribution to Brandon, and I'm wondering if we can go and talk a bit about IQ. Right. Um, can we do that? Yeah, sure. It sh what do you think? Do you think we should show a clip of the film, maybe? Um, or do you want to set it up first? I actually have a, a trailer. We also have a DVD in the inside as well. Right. <coughs> The maybe I show some photos first of that. Okay. Um, I can actually follow right after Brendan. Uh, I guess uh, 1998, 1999. While I was working on Brandon, I was already working on IKU in Tokyo. So I would be running between Amsterdam and Tokyo and uh, come up with the scenario for, uh, for IKU. And the film was shot in 1999, mm, pretty much right after the last performance of Brandon in Amsterdam, and released in 2000, so, yeah. So I wanted to know why you decided a, your interest in this idea of the replicant, which is the, which is core to the narrative in Blade Runner, and why you want to pick up this this idea of the replicant at that particular moment, and then thinking about why choose a porn film as a means to, to kind of explore that narrative, that story. Well, um, the porn film idea actually came from uh, the producer of the company in Tokyo called Uplink and he's a asai -san. he's an independent producer and he has been kind of fighting the Japanese censorship uh, for a long time. He was particularly against the, the image, you know, uh, not being able to show, like in Japan you basically cannot show an image of penis as it is, even in a photograph, even in a book. And so this is a producer, at around the time, also about 1998 or 1997, he would come to New York and get a book, a photograph book of Mapplethorpe. And he, he would go back to Tokyo with Mapplethorpe's photography book right on his hand and being confiscated by the customs for being, you know, for, for Mapplethorpe's, a lot of Mapplethorpe's uh, photos do contain, you know, uh, how do you call that? Uh, obvious sexual objects, right? Penis, yeah, basically penis. Um, and so um, he actually got his 
book confiscated and he went into the whole cold case. You know, actually only two years ago he won the cold case, by the way. Um, but anyway, so it came from this producer who said, you know, I want to make a film with you and uh, we're going to make a porn film. We're going to challenge the whole sort of sensor system, we're going to challenge the whole image, you know. And of course, I have a different encounter before that with mm -hmm. the producer. So when he asked me to do that, I said, <coughs> fine. And, you know, by that time, I've lived in Tokyo in various times. So um, I went back to Brain Run, uh, basically, I went back to uh, Brain Runner to, to look for idea to write a script. And that's what it came out in terms of the, the scripting. Here is, uh, this is sort of my record. and. And um, no, actually, it's the Deca and Rachel character. Um, I'm very interesting about this notion. I think I, I sort of continue this thing about like, you know, do enjoy ever sleep? Yeah. And then um, in IKU, I think I question like, you know, do enjoy ever arrive at orgasm? Mm. And uh, recently, I kind of did a IKU sequel called Yuki. And the premises for the piece is called uh, What Do You Do with uh, Redundant Android or Aspire Android. So it's kind of follow that a bit, yeah. Because most people here won't, have, won't be able to see the film, would we be able to show a short clip from the beginning? Mm. Oh, that's all right. It's still in it? Yeah, it's still in it. Okay. We can, I think maybe it just makes I, sense. I don't know how many people seen this film already. Tony Matthew and John. Well, show the the part of the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. But it's a film from two thousand now. <laughs> yeah. So it's thirteen years later. Old now. Yes. And it premiered in a midnight screening at Sundance, and you said 40% of the audience walked out? Yeah, I don't know. Should we stop? that back?
taste. Uh, um, so, I mean, it would be interesting to know how, where, where this film circulated and how it was intended to be seen because um, it was produced by a producer who works in the port industry. No. No? No, 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 no. He's a very uh, amazing, he's a totally uh, independent film producer. Mm -hmm. He actually produced a, a, a lot of, uh, what's the, the filmmaker? Dark uh, um, Drummond. Yeah. yeah, so he's actually produced a lot of independent art film. Uh, and uh, for this particular home film, of course, like in Japan, you have a different thing. It's called the AV film, with like adult video, which is more like the Japanese porn film with a lot of mosaic kind of image. And so like, the way that he pushed this film is really try to make explicit film. Of course, that when the film released in Japan with a 35 millimeter print for the cinema, I think we, we have to black out about 70 spots in the film, you know, so, um, yeah. So was it, was, it, was it a political gesture then to try and distribute it into, the, into these cinemas? For sure, yeah, for sure. On yeah. Yeah. And in terms of how you expected the audience to engage with it, I mean, for me, it, it kind of, the film isn't entirely hardcore, so it's not necessarily something that, it, it defies all the traditional, in my, from my experience of watching porn. The, the conventional money shot, for example. I mean, you're playing a lot with expectations. Um, was that something that you were consciously trying to provoke, is, to think about the way that the way that sexual positions in primary were constructed in the, in, the, in the film? Yes, for well, sure. But particularly in the in the sense that the film was produced in Japan, and Japan has its own kind of the most vibrant AV, you know, adult video industry. At the same time. Um, Japan has the most rigid uh, in terms of sexual uh, expression in the sense, you know. So this is in 90s uh, Tokyo and actually there was a lot of, uh, I would call them sort of sexual gender really events, really amazing. We have this uh, performance group called uh, Dumb Type, you know, who have already challenged a lot of these uh, sexual representation. So I'm kind of connected with that whole movement. So uh, it was a perfect time to produce the film. A lot of uh, the, the film, the performer, the actor, actress in the film basically make out of like half, half of the percent, uh, half of the performance, the uh, actors, actress came from the AV industry and half of them came from more performance scene. Yeah. So how has, since, since 2000, so that's a almost 13 years ago, um, how, how have you tackled the issues of gender, gender representation in your work? I don't know if you want to maybe show other works from other work that deal with this and think, or think about how the manner in which you've chosen to represent it has shifted in that period. Um. Um, since 2000, I have been, you know, I sort of relocate myself to Europe, and it is in Europe. I think, you know, I sort of recently say, since I relocate to Europe, it seems like the border collapsed for me, you know. So I was, uh, I was totally able to sort of uh, shuffling, shuffling, shuffling in the real world um, and working in different projects in that sense. Um, the particular gender issue may not be my private. Uh, primal concern at the moment. At that moment, you know, um, of course, uh, I'm still very much connected to the whole community that I we do different things. Um, the the matter is probably left uh, from 2000 to about you know from 2000 on. I was probably involved in a lot of sort of different scale of production, different scale installation or projection or um very quite different in terms of different uh, aspects of the production um i would say not until 2009 uh, when i got a residency at the hanga in barcelona that i was given the opportunity to um to be able to uh, bring in the whole gender post-gender post-poor by that time i think 
they don't call it pong anymore, they call it post pong. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so I was able to bring a lot of issue, these issues into, um, into uh, kind of I consider as a IKUC Koko Yuki. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, it was also the first time I feel I was able to kind of quite openly deal with a lot of gender uh, sex issue in a media lab situation, you know, uh, while I'm part of the kind of open source community, at the same time it has been very difficult in, within this community to deal with uh, sort of sex and gender topics, I think. How is, um, you came much, you, you manifest differently though than, than like you in terms of the mode you chose to represent it. It's not a narrative film in the same sense. Right. And it had different iterations. Can you talk a little bit about the form you chose to use for that one? Um, the Yuki actually turned out to be uh, what I call the viral performance and viral game. It's uh, sort of um, part of that had to do with uh, The first part is called uh, Yuki Viral Performance, and uh, actually I have been performing this piece um, since 2009 for uh, 2010. Um, actually going to Art Electronic Club to perform the, the, this part of performance, and uh, there is also a viral game part, so it's actually constructed in two parts. The first part is uh, um, viral performance, and the second part is viral game which actually consists of the game in two levels. One is called Infect the City, the other is called Enter the Bionet. So it's quite, um, it's a project I've been developing since 2009. And uh, actually the performance part was pretty much in sort of, uh, have been shown in quite a lot of different city, different occasions. Um, the game part was the part that kind of got difficult for me, um, I'm still, uh, looking for um, to realize it as a as a um, as a game. You know, so. Just just a couple more questions before we open up, really. Mm. And I want you touched upon this now about the tension about representing issues of gender and sexuality in this particular community. And one of one of the interests that that I focused on is the notion of queerness and how it's continued to shift in this era. And one of the things that I've noticed recently is that queer, the notion of queerness as a bracket has been appropriated by a whole range of different groups of people, um, which I believe in some senses has the potential to dilute um, some of the issues around struggle, some of the issues around representation, some of the reasons behind the activism. But it also there is a kind of tendency of it to become a kind of vogue. and I. I'm curious to get a sense from you about this idea of queerness in your work and also the kind of the tensions or the issues around representing queer issues in in the kind of media art sphere. Hmm. Well, it's interesting you mentioned the word appropriate uh, because I think uh, in the early days when the, the queerness of uh, being called queer or, or claiming yourself as queer, you actually have to appropriate back uh, of, you know, it's like a nigger kind of notion uh, that you have to kind of steal the, the word back and say, I would rather use the word queer rather than, you know, whatever sexual identity you want to identify. Um, since uh, All Mine is the one came out with a title for this talk, and actually, even when Oma came out with a title called With Queer Technology, we actually did have a bit of uh, back and forth discussion on this because uh, I was also wondering myself, like, what would be considered queer technology? You know, I think uh, normally we, we would be so narrow to think queer technology is by queer people or something like that. 
Um, I would really like to bring up this, this topic and actually say, the, for me, a, a lot of our practice now, and I think here we have a lot of maybe digital art practitioner here also, you know, and, and for me, including um, a lot of work I'm doing now, even if it has no queer, queer sexual content, and I would still consider them queer. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? <laughs> um, last year, I think uh, I have a lot of collaborate here for, for the project that uh, we staged last year called Moving Forest. Um, if I can just go to that website quickly, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, a, a sort of 12 hour performance that, that started in, in Berlin in 2008. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. um, I started in Berlin 2008 and moved down to London 2012. Kind of uh, interesting thing, we will be sitting here right in front of the Olympic site and I think, uh, you know, this is a project at the time was really time for the sort of the big castle or the Olympic uh, Stadium here. And so it's interesting to uh, think about this piece. Would I consider this piece as a, a, also a queer piece or not? You know, that's, uh, we can debate on that a bit. And it's probably not gonna work with a uh, different uh, thing, but it's okay. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah it's okay. Down, I think, I don't think we want to download it. No, it's, it's fine, you know. But uh, yeah, so that's another, question about all these kind of different work, how, how you define it as queer or not queer, or, well, it's not so much about defining it, but how I consider these works are, are queer enough for me, or, or, you know, I, I would put it in that category. But then again, it's about the technology we use, how we appropriate technology, how we, uh, how we modify technology, how we explore the technology in a different way, how how we change the normality of its functionality and you know make it into different uses. For me, that's queer enough. Mm -hmm. So on that note, yeah, maybe maybe that's a that's a <laughs> note to open up. I mean, the issue around queer technology is one that we're going to be debating heavily this year. We have a residency this year by an artist called Zach Glass who introduced us yes. to sort of email mm -hmm. who. Mm -hmm who was part of this collective called Queer Technologies, and one of the things that, that they did was they created a queer programming language that they would then shop drop into particular stores, um, which people could then purchase. Um, and I think there, there, is, there, is a lot of, there is a lot of interesting discussion to be had about this issue, but maybe on that note, we could open up to comments or questions from the audience, if anyone has any anyone wants to kick off? Um, I was wondering if um, we could maybe talk a little bit more about um, the relationship between queer and as appropriated and queerness um, with its relationship to technology and how that maybe feeds into your early practice um, where the mission really was about identity um, and I was just wondering if there were any kind of reflections that you had looking back on your, your practice from the beginning and then looking at these identity problems and you know appropriation now. Mm. I think I think you know interesting is that um, what we would say what would be the um, I just, let me just get me started then. Mm. Um, I guess it, I, I guess the problem is that the queer, the, the notion of queer that is already kind of predetermined with the, the kind of, uh, you know, sexual identity politics and all that. And so at the same time, if we want to come back to the particular technology being called queer technology, then we have to almost redefine, redefine it and be able to open up this dialogue. Uh, same thing as uh, in our society being accepted as so, you know, straight or queer, that, that, that itself is already a struggle uh, of conflict. And so within the technology itself, uh, do we want to get into that debate? Um, another 
question that can be brought up is actually would be called a gender technology in a way. You know, so that's the, the idea, the, the idea like, oh, female, male technology or how, you know, uh, recently I actually had come across quite a, a few women doing textile um, electronic, for example, you know, so it's like uh, funny that people would say, oh, God, only women is doing textile um, electronic uh, work uh, rather than men doing that, you know, so there's also this gender male-female issue, which is very binary, of course. So um, to expand the binary into queer would bring us, you know, open up quite a bit, and that's exactly, I really like, you know, be able to do that and using this occasion. Do we have any other comments? Yeah, that's uh, maybe, yeah, to the view. Comment. Well, I kind of want to say something about what you said earlier about the 90s or the 80s in New York. And mm. then, I don't know, it's just a mishmash of that and Tijuana and uh, Amsterdam and those things happening pre-internet and then queer and technology going together maybe at the time of the onset of the World Wide Web mm -hmm. and that all that kind of evangelism around what was seen as a poten potentiality for queering each other through those virtual means and then the dystopic kind of feeling about it all now and maybe that's I don't know, it's just an ill-formed thought. That there's a dystopic feeling about all those evangelical moments of technology through, even now with free software and open source kind of initiatives, that they're all capitalised in the end and that there's a dystopic feeling about the whole thing. And no, there is no querying of anything because it will be capitalised if it's a... Um, I don't know what. It's <laughs> <laughs> just got some... Random thoughts. Julie. <laughs> but actually, Omar, when you say, when you just talk about like how people are kind of appropriate the, the queer and uh, queerness and how you mm. feel about that, how, what, what do you particularly? Well, I mean, one thing particularly is, it's very specific to me anyway, is yeah. for me the, the issue of, of queerness is, some, first of all, you're right, it's something that's already been appropriated by from a slanderous term into one, of, one about camaraderie and kinship, this idea, this notion of queerness. Um, and a, a lot of the writing that I do is very much focusing still on this struggle for queer visibility and queer representation, thinking very particularly about my own biography. Mm -hmm. However, um, a, and very much thinking about the idea of a homosexual, for example, as someone who desires other men, uh, etc. However, there are, and particularly I've noticed a group of artists, of which some of whom I've worked with, um, critique the idea of queerness being ascribed or prescribed to people who choose to identify as homosexual, lesbian, or gay, as by arguing that lesbian, being a lesbian, being homosexual, is actually promoting a binary. However, it's heterosexuals who choose to choose to call themselves queer as a kind of lifestyle choice. Um, and see that their, their practice, their work, their being as something that's queer, which is not something that I'm necessarily averse to at all, but I think there is, for me, a potential for that to make, to make, to undermine this idea of struggle, which I think binds queer people together, um, historically. And so I guess that was what I was talking about, particularly by this idea of queer, the queerness changing to something that was potentially a vogue or a lifestyle choice, so something that you, you could argue that anyone who reads Days of Confused or anyone in the page of Days of Confused is queer. You know, uh, the idea of the art fag, the ubiquity and the rise of the art fag as a, as a kind of figure as well. So I don't know if you have comments or feedback about that. Do, do, do you think it's fine? Do you think it's polemical? Um, 
I think it, the particular field of uh, particular field meaning like you know the, the particular digital media are uh, you know not in that fine art category uh, and and the media lab uh, situation that I have been uh, situ situated myself in for the last uh, you know many years and uh, it is a very you know male dominated uh, situation and and then you start seeing a lot of very active women involved and you start seeing women start making their own collectives start organizing their own workshops so you you see this emergence of that uh, it is really uh it's true it's only like recent years you start seeing the the so called queer more like trans um, identity is being brought into the whole debate, mm -hmm. right? Um, I am a little bit. Uh, I, I always feel it's very problematical to uh, to promote uh, the queerness for queerness per se. You know, same as the the kind of woman issue, and and that still bothers me. Um, in the way that I would sometimes rather not to deal with gender issues in mm -hmm. a lot of my work. I don't know if this kind of responds to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Just a bit, yeah. I mean, I think that there's another thing as well about thinking, touching upon this idea of the art world as a safe space for these issues to be debated as well. Which, I mean, because the, the, the one thing that I, m the most, most commonly reference now is the the performance of video artist Wu Sang, for example, who's intersex, um, who's become kind of adopted by especially the New York and the North American art world as this kind of glamorous figure. No one knows if it's a he or a she. Um, uh, and it feels like the, 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 that particular sphere is the only safe space for that, that particular kind of performance, that particular character to exist. But then talking to Wu on a one-to-one -one level, you realize that there is a degree of performed queerness, as it were, because of the construct of the art world in which he's operating. So I don't know if that, that's a question so much as a comment, um, but I guess one of the things that you kind of, that, that I was surprised about is, is when you started working, especially in the, in, the, in the 80s and the 90s, was the kind of, the almost willingness to, to look at these issues as almost matter of fact, and for them to kind of exist in the sphere. Uh, while as now, I mean, I, I, I feel that, especially in North America, that kind of context has, has shifted some more. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Maybe Rachel has a <laughs> comment on this? Me? Yeah. I was told you were going to propose something. Oh, well, I, I very casually um, referred to a debate that's current at the moment to Julie um, on various feminist mayonnaise. There's, there's a tension between the radical feminists, some radical feminists, and uh, the transgender community in as much as the, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a kind of thread of, or perceived thread of transphobia coming from the radical feminist contingent, or, or because um, the, well, I guess because, I mean, the, this idea of abolishing gender is something that radical feminists talk about. And in that sense, they're eager to have female-only spaces to talk about this. Um, and the, the transgender community feel excluded, especially, uh, yeah, the male-to-female transgender community feeling that they should be included in these discussions. So that's, I was just kind of interested in that conflict that seems to be coming at the moment. And I guess this, this idea that, you know, the transgendered subject, male to female in any case, tends towards a um, male idea of femininity often, which I think the radical feminists object to. This idea of, the, you know, the, uber hyper feminine body um, but yeah I mean I mentioned that before I came I didn't I don't I didn't think it was particularly relevant to bring it up um, I mean, in, in discussion right now 
there may be something that people want to talk about, I don't know. I think that just sparked something with me about, like I was thinking that the technology um, queer debate has quite a lot to do with um, ghettoisation and technology within the art world and, you know, queer society within like, the larger society, but maybe that's something, it's about tribes and tribalism mm -hmm. and space, and I think space is, um, is something that needs to be debated within a technology, you know, environment as well, but, you know, I'm, I was interested in the way that those two kind of related to each other. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how to think about these issues via technology yet. I mean, there, there was the classic discourse in the 90s because, you know, the, the internet, the online, the, the occasion, the online communities offered of being able to invent gender or perform gender online was something that people were very, very curious about and experimenting with. Um, but that's, yeah, that kind of, that moment has probably passed. Um, but it's, it's an interesting point <laughs> to think about that. And have you, have you ever looked at worlds like Second Life or those interactive environments? Yeah. Because one of the things that I noticed was we have we have an artist who's in residence here called John Ruffman, and he was showing um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, his he makes these machinima films where he's basically pulling the footage from Second Life and creating these narrative films. But the manner in which femininity was portrayed was very much a, ve a very much a hyper kind of femininity that was that was seen through a, a male lens or a male gaze. So. Have you ever tried to particularly intervene in those spaces, or how do you how do you engage with those particular spaces personally? Um, I don't really deal with uh, second life at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, um, for me, it's uh, it still is an enclosure uh, society, enclosure space. You know, of course, once you you all moved in there, then you can have certain interaction, you know, but for me it's a very uh, self-enclosure uh, mm -hmm. space, which I'm, I don't really work with that kind of space mm -hmm. that much. Uh, uh, we have time for one more comment or question, and it's definitely there. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask, thinking about these ideas of gender technology and sort of gender binaries that you were talking about, um, how this related to I IKU mm -hmm. and sort of the gender representation that was happening within that production? In, in, in the case of IKU, IKU. Yeah. IKU. Uh, the gender technology? Well, no, just thinking about these themes and oh, how you kind of use the I think, I think, yeah, I think IKU is probably the, the kind of uh, porno film that kind of defy, defy all these uh, notion because I, I think if you understand the porno film is actually a very uh, defined uh, filmmaking so you you have porno film for straight people you have uh, porno film for people who like animal you have gay less uh, gay porn you have lesbian porn you know none of these uh, categories should be mixed and uh, I can you is a kind of porn that actually mix all these things uh, the beginning, you know, we don't spoil the, the, the film for you, but the, the person, uh, the black guy in the beginning of the film is actually a transgender uh, person, you know, which was revealed more uh, at the end of the film. Um, so that was really trying to deal with a lot of these uh, notion of, you know, what, what is a, the notion of a, a big cock means, you know. Um, speaking of money shot, uh, in IKU, I could not deal with a lot with money shot, uh, mainly because of the censorship in Tokyo. Even if I shoot it, you know, I would have to black it out. And uh, at the end, we we did have a, a couple, but I think in different situations, mm -hmm. got cut out or something. Um, but I'm going to make a money shot film next year in Berlin. It's going to be totally about money shot. Yeah. yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, that's, maybe that's a good to end, just tell us a bit about your next film, because <laughs> your next film, Fluid, is yeah, money shot galore. Um, and 
<laughs> Do you want to tell us a, a bit about it? Um, yeah, actually, it's a it's a film called Fuit, Fuit, uh, and it's a movie that uh, it's a film I conceived uh, in two thousand, right after I finished IKU, and it was a it was actually conceived for uh, uh, for Last Long Trio. It, it was a production that was commissioned uh, a script that commissioned by uh, Last Long Trio's company. At the time, within the Zen Chopa, there's a division called Pussy Power. Um, so I, I made up this story uh, called Fui, which would be dealing with a kind of, um, it's actually dealing with the AIDS virus uh, being mutated and, uh, you know, things like that. And uh, how the ejaculation the can become a sort of drug. <coughs> you saw the image there, haven't you? In the yeah, actually, um, let me see if I can. Yeah. Here we go. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, so it's a very, um, I, I'm very happy that after 13 years, 14 years, I, I would get to make the film next year in Berlin. And where do you imagine it being seen? Where are you hoping to It's see? totally commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till you see the shot if it comes up. <laughs> yeah. It will be totally commercial, I hope. Um, you know, I, I think I, I give up uh, our will kind of sell masturbation filmmaking. <laughs> some reason doesn't seem to want to be coming up, but maybe this should just stay in people's imagination <laughs> as this white screen. Um, I'll try and get it up in a second, but... Um, yeah, it's kind of funny. I think the thing is that there's something with your PDF thing you know, on this computer. Yeah, I think I'll try and get it up before everyone leaves, but um, yeah. I think we can continue the conversation in the bar downstairs. I want to okay, thank fantastic. But I want to thank you all for coming, and more than anything, I want to thank you, Shuli, for, um, for your time. Could I just do a bit of self-emotion? Yeah, of course, please. <laughs> this is actually the, the gallery view in the follow view, um, but it's interactive. It's uh, some stuff <coughs> taken from Yuki and also can find another work of mine, but it's uh, quite interactive, and I hope you make your way to uh, follow view. And also, we uh, I'm showing with Mark America, who also came from America, and so you would get the the two shows uh, in one, and uh, the show should go on till mid October. So I hope you do make your way there. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah.